Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, where food bloggers come to get their fill of the latest tips, tricks, and insight into the world of food blogging. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll provide you with the tools you need to add value to your blog, and we'll also ensure you're taking care of yourself because food blogging is a demanding job. Now, please welcome your host, Megan Porta. Food bloggers, hey, are you looking for new ways to make money as a blogger? If so, we have got your back. We have launched an ebook called Conversations on Monetization. Inside this resource, we take your favorite podcast episodes about monetization and we put them all in one easy, accessible package. We threw a few exclusive interviews in as well. Friends, there are so many ways to monetize your food blog. Inside this ebook, we have interviews with success stories like Todd Bullock, Alyssa Brantley, Kelly McNellis, Jenna Carlin, and more. All of these examples have become successful through completely different monetization strategies. Whether you are a brand new blogger looking for your very first revenue stream, or you are a seasoned pro wanting to diversify, this ebook is for you. Go to eatblogtalk.com to grab your copy, and we can't wait to hear your success story with monetization. Hey, food bloggers. Welcome to Eat Blog Talk. This podcast is for you, food bloggers wanting value and clarity to help you find greater success in your business. Today, I'm so excited I get to spend a little bit of time talking to Lexi Harrison from crowdedkitchen.com. And we are going to chat about how to grow on Instagram in 2021 and also how photography plays a role. Lexi co-founded Crowded Kitchen in 2017 with her mom, Beth. This mom and daughter duo share plant-based recipes with a focus on easy, nutritious weeknight meals. Lexi is also a full-time professional food photographer with several clients in the food and beverage industries. Lexi, I am really excited to dive into this today with you, but first, we all want to hear your fun fact. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to chat about Instagram today. I know it's a much desired topic, so... (laughs) Yeah. So my fun fact. So growing up, my family actually hosted eight exchange students from seven different countries and they each lived with us for a year at a time. So now I have eight sisters all over the world, which is just a really cool thing. And it's been amazing. So yeah. I think that's such a gift for parents who have the the capacity to do something like that to give to their children. And I know some families from my childhood that did the same thing. They just kind of liked that. Like they they enjoyed inviting people from different parts of the world in and having them as part of their family for a period of time. And they thrived. Like those families rocked it. They were so awesome. And Do you find that you keep in touch with all of them or are there a few that are kind of like favorites or? Yeah, no, I definitely keep in touch with some more than others. Uh, It's we started when I was in second grade and the last one we had was my senior year of high school. So they were kind of and they were all about I think they were all 16 when they lived with us. So, of course, the ones uh, that were older when I was in high school. I'm a little bit closer with because we have more in common, but uh, I still keep in touch with four or five of them super regularly. And three of them came to my wedding a few years ago. So that was really awesome. Oh, that's so cool. And you have places to go visit, right? In other parts of the world. Yep. We've visited several of them and it's been absolutely incredible every time. Oh, I love. See, this is why I like doing fun facts because this is something that I probably would never know about you. And it just gives me a little extra something. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Okay. You have a really cool story to share about the way you and your mom started your business. And I'm yeah, I'm just going to let you talk through that if you don't mind. Just give us the scoop on how you started and how kind of how it progressed. Sure. So I we actually I started an Instagram account. We used to be called Superfood Runner back when I was in college. Uh, I was on the track and cross country team, which is where the runner part came in. Um, I kind of just started it as a passion project. I had some food allergy issues. Uh, I went to a very small college, so we didn't have a lot of dining options. So I kind of just started it as a fun thing to do to document how I was eating as a college athlete. And 
pretty soon after I started that, I decided to study abroad. And my mom at the same time had, well, she, she coached me in high school. So we've always had a super close relationship and we've both always been interested in nutrition. And she decided on her own to just take some nutrition and photography classes. And so she was like, okay, well, I'm totally happy. I'm going to be cooking a lot. I think it fits well with what you're doing. So I'm totally happy to kind of take over while you're abroad and just start posting some of the stuff I'm making. So I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, it's just for fun. So we started doing that together. And then I graduated college that year and started working at a food media company in New York. And over the course of that first year of my career, I kind of was able to develop the skills that I needed to in this industry. And I learned so much. And by the end of the year, my mom and I were still still working on this account together. And we were like, you know what, I think that we can take this to the next level and really make this work as a full time business. So I moved back home to Michigan in 2017, I guess it was. And we rebranded to Crowded Kitchen that year. And we've just been doing it ever since then together. So we work together, usually about three days a week, we shoot all of our content at her house. She does all of the recipe development for us. Um, I head up the photography, any of the creative stuff and all of the business development. And then my husband actually very recently joined the team as well. So it's really a family effort. (laughs) So definitely always a crowded kitchen. And it's really been just an incredible experience to be able to work with my mom and we've developed an even closer relationship and the business has grown tremendously in the course of the last probably about two years. So that's kind of where we're at now. That's so great. Good for you guys. And I love that you guys are a mom daughter team. That does not happen very often. Every once in a while, I'll see that and I'll be like, that's so cool. What a great way for you guys to connect. And it sounds like you really complement each other well, as far as like what your strengths are. So That's awesome. I love that. And how does your husband fit into it? Did he come in without missing a beat or was he like, did it take him a little bit of time to adjust? How did that go? Yeah. So it actually, I mean, it kind of happened because of COVID. He started working at home. He used to work in finance. And once he started working from home, like one of our biggest goals, we've only been married for two years. We don't have any kids or anything, but we've always known that we we really want to be able to have a specific kind of lifestyle where we have the ability to travel. I mean, obviously not right now, but (laughs) in the future and just have a really flexible lifestyle. And as soon as he started working from home, he was like, Oh, this is pretty nice. (laughs) So we just, uh, we realized that we could kind of take a little bit of a leap of faith and make it work. And he's actually, it's been amazing. We've grown a lot in the last few months and been able to do a lot of backend stuff on the website, SEO, and other stuff that we would not have been able to do had he not been a part of the team. So it's been amazing. I wonder how many people have flipped over to the entrepreneurial life just because of COVID, because people were forced to be at home. And I know like my sister, she, her whole life has loved working. She's loved going to an office. She loves her job. She loves being around people. She likes being in downtown. And now since COVID, she's like, oh my gosh, I kind of want to stay home. This is amazing. She started becoming like an artist, which I didn't like that never came out of her before. And she's doing all this art and she's incredible. And like, I don't think she ever would have learned that if it weren't for COVID. So it's one of those uh, happy accidents that came out of a terrible situation, right? So so cool how that worked out for you guys. Okay, let's talk strategy because clearly you have put together a strategy that really works on Instagram. And I love a good strategy. So tell us all of your secrets. Sure. So I'm just going to preface this by saying that it's definitely not a one size fits all approach. Um, And I think that anybody who says that they've kind of mastered the Instagram algorithm is probably lying because nobody really knows what's going on and it changes so frequently. But I will say that there are several things that we have implemented in maybe the last six months or so. And we've seen definite growth from these things. So, and I actually, I was just talking this morning with Food by Maria. Maria, I know you had her. I think you oh, had yeah, her. Oh, yeah, I love her. She's recently. awesome. Yep. Yeah. So we were chatting, and she has actually uh, been struggling a little bit with growth on Instagram. And she'd asked for a few tips a little while ago. And she just messaged me this morning saying, like, wow, I think this is actually working. I'm finally growing. 
So now we have two case studies going. So I think <laughs> these tips hopefully will work for a lot of people. So a few of the things that we focus on. The most important thing to me is that we are continuously improving, uh, pretty much ever, trying to continuously improve everything, but mostly uh, photography because obviously there's so much competition on Instagram and I think it's really important to develop your own personal photography style that helps you stand out amongst the crowd. So over the course of the last few years, I have really tried to continually invest in my photography skills, whether that means just learning about editing, uh, taking courses. We actually went to an amazing in-person workshop about a year and a half ago that was tremendously helpful and also investing in props and backdrops and just really studying photographers that I admire. Um, one of the things that helped me a lot early on was downloading presets from my favorite food photographers and just looking at uh, when, you know, when you apply a preset to your photo, you can see what the changes have, how the changes have been made um, and just studying like what changes they were making in their edits to have a certain effect in the photo. And so that kind of helped me learn how to edit and how to develop my own style and what things in a photo were important to me. So that has been super important to us. And we've definitely noticed that as our photography has improved, we have grown on social media. Um, another thing that I think has been super important for us over the last few months is incorporating a variety of content. So instead of just posting still photos, we try to incorporate stop motion videos or longer form videos or carousels, obviously reels, you know, the whole shebang. So um, can I, can I stop you just for a second? Can you explain what a stop motion video is? Yes. So basically stop motion is a bunch of photos that you stitch together into a video. So it kind of has that choppy effect. It's like a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it, but uh, yeah. So it's basically like a little animation and what we use them for is often if it's an, a recipe where you're assembling something. So we recently had a video for collard green wraps and the stop motion was like showing each ingredient going in and then showing how to wrap it. So it was really short. I think it was only about 10 seconds, but it was such a fun little video, such a fun little animation that it just did insanely well for us. Um, I love those. They're so appealing and there are not very many of them out there. So when I do see them and I think actually Maria, she does those, correct? And I, every time I see one, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. How do you create those? So, th so this one that I'm talking about right now was actually an accident. So basically I was actually just trying to take um, process photos for my blog post and I was using an overhead tripod and we were like, okay, we're just going to take a bunch of photos because I don't really know what's going to turn out well. So we were just take, con taking continuous photos while uh, assembling the collared green wrap. And then since we were using a tripod, they were all in the same position. So I was like, oh, wait, this would actually be a really cool stop motion. So basically, I just exported all of the individual photos and then stitch them in, them together in uh, Premiere Pro. Oh, so. cool. Yeah. That, I mean, that really wouldn't be that hard to do. And it's not, and it's yeah. just different enough that people are going to stop and go, whoa, that's not a full on video. And it's exactly. not a single frame photo. So I think that is gold right there, just incorporating one of those in to see how people react to it. Exactly. Yeah. And so you mentioned carousels too. So that's when you scroll through, maybe you see like a few images um, of the process and a hero shot or something like that. How many do you usually include within a carousel? Yeah. So lately our strategy with carousels has been to, uh, well, for SEO purposes, we've been doing a lot more process shots and ingredient shots. So we found that actually, if you start with the hero photo and then show maybe an ingredient shot, a process shot and another really nice image of it, it, it just gives people a better idea of what the recipe is and encourages them to go to the blog. And that's something I wanted to talk about as well is that, you know, we've actually, I know that a lot of bloggers think that there's not much value in social media when it comes to um, converting to blog traffic. But since we've been able to grow 
our social media so much, we've actually seen a lot of traffic just from Instagram alone. And I think that you shouldn't discount that. Um, this, it can be really helpful to create content that actually makes people want to go to your site. Yeah, that is a hot topic because there people are all over the place on opinions with that. I, I go back and forth too. So I hesitate to even, I don't even have an opinion right now about it because there are some days when I'm like, ugh, I don't have the time for Instagram. I'm not getting quote direct clicks. But then there are other days where I see people like you and Maria who are just killing it on Instagram and you create these beautiful images and photos that you display there. And then I get inspired and I feel like, okay, I really need to dig into this. So it's one of those things I feel like we, all of us go back and forth about. I loved hearing that from you, from someone who really has just figured it out. So is there anything else you can say to convince people? I mean, you saw blog growth because of this. What other reasons would you give us to do this? Yeah. So for us, like I said, you know, we started in 2017. And at that point, we honestly did not really know anything about how to blog. I truly did not understand that you could make money (laughs) through ad revenue. So for us, it was like, okay, well, how can we make money through this growing Instagram account that we have? And I think at that time, we had about 30,000 followers. And we were like, okay, we're just going to put effort into this. And we had seen a couple of sponsored posts come through for not a ton of money, but enough that we were like, hmm, like if we really continue to grow, we can really leverage this. And so as we grew, we started developing these amazing long-term partnerships with brands just through Instagram. And that's actually pretty much completely how we've grown our business. And that has allowed us then to you know, have my husband work with us and start the blog and really focus on doing the blog the right way and taking our time and still having this income from these sponsored partnerships that are mostly because of our Instagram account. Um, And another thing that has been really great for us is we've also, since we've been really focusing on our photography and videography skills over the last few years, we've actually been able to develop quite a few partnerships for freelance photography and recipe development uh, for various brands. So that's actually, honestly, at this point, it's probably about 40 to 50% of our revenue. So yeah, so that has been, you know, building that presence on social media and improving our skills has really allowed us to grow a sustainable business where we're now able to add in the blog and have that grow, you know, I hope that that eventually becomes our primary source of income. But for now, it's allowing us to do what we need to do. So that's so great. I love that you guys have different pieces of it that are working for you and bringing in money. And I feel like so many food bloggers, myself included for many years, get so focused on the ad revenue that they lose sight of all of that other opportunity. And they don't realize that, I mean, they don't stop to just take a step back and see that there are many other ways to make money. And this is one avenue that's obviously been lucrative for you. And could definitely be lucrative for many other food bloggers. And I mean, the tips you gave are very good, but very simple, like focus on your photos and use a variety of content. I mean, it's very simple if you just take the time to do it, right? Yes, no, definitely. And I mean, there's there are definitely a lot of other things that potentially go into it. And I know that several Instagrammers specifically have had a lot of success with Uh, kind of sharing more about their personal lives and sharing more personal photos. I personally don't, I'm not super comfortable with that. And so I I know that, you know, a lot of people have had success with doing that. So that's one thing to consider as well. But I think it's also nice to know that if that's not necessarily you, there are still other ways to grow your Instagram account. Um, Yeah, that's good to hear that you have made it work without doing that because everybody has a different opinion on that. And we do always hear you have to get in front of the camera, you have to show everyone what you're doing, but not necessarily. I think that's so unique to everybody. 
So how do you handle like stories? Do you put yourself there at all? Or do you keep yourself out of stories as well? I definitely need to be better about filming stories altogether. (laughs) Um, That's a low point for me. But I do try to I try to do a lot of uh, recipe tutorials. So I'll actually show us cooking a recipe that's on our blog and then linking to it. Um, so it's obviously more, much more informal than our posts, uh, but I'm just not very good at talking in front of the camera. So <laughs> I don't do a ton of that. I, I mean, I know that I should do a little bit more, but I'm just, I'm still working on that. But <laughs> yeah, that's all right. We all have stuff we're always working on, right? Yeah, exactly. So for others, what do you recommend for stories? Do you recommend, I know some people, say like you should always have a story up like going at all times do you believe that I think that it's definitely helpful to have at least one or two stories every day it doesn't have to be anything fancy like every Sunday we just we have a a meal plan that goes out through our email so you know we just link to the recipes that are in our meal plan so that's really simple it only takes like five minutes to pull together Um, I think it's more important to be consistent with your Instagram posts And that's actually something um, I wanted to talk about is we have actually been experimenting a lot with posting twice a day, which I know sounds scary to some people, but we post, we repost things all the time. And I feel like there's some kind of negative connotation with that, but I'm just going to give a little case study from a recent post that we had. And so, okay. So This is a Greek chickpea salad that has, for whatever reason, been one of our most popular posts on Instagram. I think we posted it, we first posted it in March, we posted it again in August, and then I posted it, I think on like January 2nd or something. It ended up getting over 10,000 likes, 3,000 saves, and a reach of over 315,000. But 100, no, 250,000 of that was either from the explore page or hashtags. So like almost everybody that was seeing the post wasn't even following us before. So yeah, so I think it's just important to consider the fact that, you know, especially if you have a larger audience, Instagram is not showing your posts to very many people every time you post, unfortunately. So there's nothing wrong with reposting content that's already done well for you or just a slightly different shot of something Like we've never had somebody be like, oh, didn't you just post that recently? Like people don't notice. So I think it's really, it's much, we've seen a lot more success from reposting things more often. So that allows us to just post like twice a day, a few times a week. That is a really great tip. And how cool to hear you talk through those numbers. That's really astonishing. Oh my gosh, that's so many people looking at your content. That was a big one for us. Definitely. That's definitely not the average post, but (laughs) yeah, that is massive. But just like what you said, just kind of experimenting. If something does really well, try it again the next season and see if people are still liking it then. It really can't hurt. And I cycle through my content all the time. Um, I don't think anybody notices. If they do, I don't think they care because I only put images that look delicious up. So I think if anything, they're like, oh, that's right. She has a really good meatloaf recipe. Maybe I should go look for it. So I think it really can't hurt. And people do get hung up on, well, they know that I already have that recipe. I already did, I already posted that in November. They're going to be, I don't know, offended. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone's ever going to get offended no. if you post, repost your content. Definitely so not. <laughs> do you have any other tips, just kind of general tips aside from what you've already mentioned? Yeah. So one more thing that we have seen, and this is actually something I've been experimenting with very recently but I've just kind of noticed it as a trend over the last few months, our posts that do best tend to be pretty close up crops. um, And they tend to be definitely more colorful, bright, bold, natural colors. Um, So for example, actually this chickpea salad is a great example because it was just the salad in a bowl cropped super close up. So you're just seeing the ingredients and the freshness. And it kind of just, I think since it's such a close crop, it it kind of really jumps off the screen. And so we've been experimenting with a lot of different posts like this, and they've been really improving our growth. So I think, and actually Maria said that 
same for her. So hmm. I'm looking at your account right now and yeah, it's all like very close up and very colorful, which is kind of my style too. I've always loved the really close up shots and I know that's not a super common thing because everyone likes to do a variety, like maybe an entire scene or like maybe overhead, like really far away, which is great, I think, for your blog. But for Instagram, I sometimes get hung up on that on my own. I look through my feed and I'm like, oh, that's so close. Is that OK? But I like hearing that now from you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's really interesting to see. And I, I agree. I mean, I really I love shooting larger scenes. Um, it's more fun. I think it's more fun to style, but <laughs> for whatever reason, these close-ups are what what seem to be doing best. So I'm going to go with Yeah, this. absolutely. And what do you think about um, portrait versus landscape? I know people I'm seeing on Instagram are kind of experimenting with that. Forever it was more portrait. And now I'm seeing some bigger bloggers go more landscape, just or like square, I guess, but not as long. I always go portrait. I, I just am of the mindset that the more of somebody's phone that the photo takes up, the better. <laughs> um, and actually, same goes for, for video content. One thing I have been doing recently is I, I shoot all of my video for website um, in landscape. But I actually, after I export it, I crop it into the same size as this uh, vertical dimension on Instagram, which is, I think, like 1080 by 1320 or something. So I actually crop it like that, which is kind of a weird crop because it's really close in. But I've noticed that has been also performing better for video instead of the standard square. Cool. I am lost in your account right now. I feel like I could <laughs> literally look through here all day. I'm just scrolling through and I've completely gone off my notes. So I need to go back to my notes. OK. <laughs> wow. You have such amazing photos and everything is just it's really interesting. I think that's the thing. Like I clicked on one and it, and it was more of that um, like stop motion video that you were talking about. That's so interesting. And then you have a video and then just like super colorful photos. So guys, like go look at crowded kitchen. It's crowded underscore kitchen on Instagram. And You've got gold on here, Lexi. You guys are amazing. Oh, oh I love it. I'm going to come back here later today and just browse through and <laughs> like every single image that you've posted. <laughs> so nice. Thank you. Oh, I love it. Okay. So what else do you have for us? Do you have any other extra kind of just overall strategy tips? Um, I think, yeah, like I said, I think it's really just developing your own style because as we've all seen on social media or on Instagram specifically the last few years, I think there tends to be this kind of very similar aesthetic on many pages, which is totally fine. And like, I love a beautiful light and bright photo, but I think when everybody starts to do the same thing, it just makes it really hard for you to stand out. So we definitely got a little bit caught up in that for a while too. And then we were like, no, you know what, we're just going to stick with our own thing and, and see what happens. And it's actually not only do I feel more comfortable with that because I am able to experiment with different types of photography, but I also think that it's really helped us grow. So I, I think just encouraging people to not get stuck in one type of aesthetic, to really experiment with different types of photography, try using um, artificial light, try using like direct light, try different styles of editing. There's just so many things that you can do to make your photos stand out without necessarily putting in a ton more effort. How do you recommend we go about that? Because it we are so easily influenced by what we see and we scroll on Instagram all the time and we look at all of these other delicious food photos. So we want to emulate those other photographers' styles. How do we develop our own? My personal inspiration is to focus on the colors of the food itself and the ingredients and kind of just like if I'm styling a scene I first think about the colors and the textures of the dish. And then I try to really pick out like interesting props, but things that won't make the scene too complicated. And I think that it's important to invest in new props and backgrounds from time to time, because I think, and I know that like everybody is different. And if you're just photographing for your blog, that's fine. Maybe you can kind of stick with the same style, but in order to really stand out on Instagram, you have to, you really have to, try a few different things to find your your style and find what, what's going to work best for you. So like every few months, I 
invest in some new props and some new different backdrops. And it's re- that has been actually a key thing in, in improving my photography over the years, because it, if you get stuck and you're like, you feel like you're always using the same backdrops, the same orientations. Like as soon as you get something new, you're like, Oh wow. I never thought that I could put this together or like, wow, these colors look amazing together. Like I recently got this really bright, bold green backdrop and it just really made um, the salad pop that I was photographing the other day. So it's just, just trying new things all the time. I am stuck on this one. It's your spiced citrus mold wine. The photo for this is so gorgeous. I've scrolled past it like 20 times now. (laughs) And I didn't notice that your descriptions are very short. Do you recommend just keeping it super short and sweet? Or does that kind of uh, just depend on what your style is too? Definitely. I think uh, some people do really well with very long captions. um, And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with how in depth and personal you want to get on your account. Uh, like I said, since I am not super comfortable with that, I tend to focus most just like completely on the recipe. So yeah, so I typically try to keep the captions pretty short, maybe two to three sentences. Um, sometimes if it's a brand new recipe, I will go into it a little bit more, but especially if it's something I'm reposting, I mean, sometimes I'll just, just like literally say what it is and then say recipe link in bio which uh, I find has always been worked totally fine for us. Again, totally up to you. Um, And another thing that I've actually recently become convinced of is that hashtags actually do matter. I really didn't think they did, but they do. (laughs) Talk us through your hashtag strategy. Yeah, so I, I have a set amount, I think it's about 15 to 20 that I use on every single post. And those are just kind of the standard, uh, like for us, it's like vegan recipe or hashtag food photography, just really basic ones like that. And, but then I actually add probably about 10 to probably about 10 unique hashtags to every single post that go a little bit more depth into the recipe or like a season, or if there's any kind of event surrounding the recipe. And I found that doing that has definitely improved our reach on certain posts. Um, It doesn't work every time, but especially like in early January, once healthy recipes were really popular, that had we had a couple posts go insanely viral just from using the hashtags. And you can tell that by the uh, insights. How do you choose those? Honestly, mostly just random, but usually I'll type, I'll just type them in as I'm typing the caption and it shows you, you know, it shows you once you type a hashtag, how many views it has. And so I try to do hashtags that aren't insanely huge, but usually have maybe a couple hundred thousand. So then you're more, you're more likely to show up towards the top and not get lost. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then do you use a schedule or do you do everything manually? I do everything manually. Sometimes I will s- type them out and save them within the app. Like I have my posts for later already ready to go. But um, I know that some people do love planners. I'm just not the most organized person. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which has actually worked well for you, I think, because there are certain things that you cannot do in schedulers. I'm learning like um, Tailwind I use for scheduling and you can't do carousels. And maybe that has changed. But a couple months ago, I was like, this has to work. And it just wasn't working, which is super frustrating because... I mean, if you're scheduling, you want to schedule. (laughs) You don't want to like dabble in both. At least that's my preference. So that was really frustrating for me. I don't know. I've considered actually trying just manually posting to Instagram for a time for maybe like a month just to see if my traffic goes up or my traffic, my followers goes up because why not? Right. I mean, it's all about experimenting and like you said, and just seeing what works for you. Exactly. These are all such great tips. Okay, I have one more question and then I will ask if we've missed anything, but I'm curious about editing. You have put a heavy focus on photography and just making sure everything looks delicious. You're adhering to your personal style and colorful. Do you have any editing tips for, I'm assuming you use Lightroom because you were yes. using some Lightroom terms. Okay, what are some just quick, easy Lightroom tips that you have for us? Yeah. So I think my biggest tip would be that 
you can always do more than you think. So like, even if you're just using the super basic editing tools, like brightness and uh, white and black levels, like I think that a lot of people are always a bit hesitant to really change those numbers, but I literally will just sit there with the uh, dial and just move it up and down really drastically. (laughs) And sometimes you find that you need to make a huge change and that's totally fine. So I think just not being afraid to really experiment with the different editing tools on Lightroom um, and really not being afraid to really increase the saturation of a certain color. I mean, obviously I try never to make anything look unnatural, but sometimes it just does, especially for uh, on a raw image, it doesn't really necessarily bring across the colors that you actually see in real life. So I think just not being afraid to really bump up the intensity of your editing. And that's kind of always been how I do things. I just like, I really increase the, um, I mean, I can walk you through kind of my general edits. If yeah. You why don't you do that? Yeah. Yeah. So like, I'm just looking at a photo that I was working on earlier. Um, I almost always bump up my exposure a little bit based on my, um, uh, based on how the lighting was that day. Uh, I usually have my highlights go down, my shadows up a little bit, whites up and blacks down, which is what creates contrast. And then a really important editing tool is clarity, which is just gonna make your photo a lot more crisp and lifelike. So I always bump that up to like at least 30. And then from there, I pretty much just play around with the colors. Um, I, I'm not going to go through my exact technique on that cause it takes a while, but, um, the last most important tool that I use is the masking and brush tool, which allows you to focus on certain parts of the photo and really bring out different colors or to brighten specific parts of the photo while you leave the rest of it the same. Um, and so this is what kind of helps you make a photo focus in one specific area instead of just having kind of a flat basic uh, frame. So, I mean, a lot of it also depends on the lighting that you're shooting with. So it's totally dependent on that, but that's kind of how I approach my editing. Again, it doesn't hurt to just go in and experiment. And I mean, you can always revert. You can do a million tweaks and go back to the original at any given time. So just play around. I like what you do, what you were talking through, or you said you like bumped it up really high just to see Mm -hmm. and you don't want it to look unnatural. And then maybe you, so you back off from there a little bit and just play with it. I always bump up my color. That's one of my things too. I love food photos that pop. And I think color is such a good way to just captivate people's attention and Definitely. if you see a flat photo I don't I typically just kind of scroll right by those but the ones that I really stop at are the ones like your mold wine that is like wow there's so much vibrance here and so much color and Lightroom is amazing you can do so really much inside of that little application there's so much power in there so use it and just play around and experiment see how your Instagram peeps are loving it. (laughs) Exactly. And yeah, like I said earlier, I would definitely stress uh, downloading if you have a favorite food photographer or something, if they have presets available, just download them just so you can see, even if you don't actually use them on your photos, like I don't really ever use presets, but at least you can see what they do to their photos to make them pop. And then you can try to replicate that in your own life. Oh, this has been so amazing, Lexi. What would you say would be your number one takeaway for food bloggers listening today on Instagram or photography or anything that we've covered? I think just continual improvement and continuing to work on your skills all the time and try different things and not give up. Cause I know, I mean, believe me, I know firsthand how incredibly frustrating the Instagram algorithm can be. And we definitely have our ups and downs, but if you just keep at it and continue it, continue to try different things. Eventually it will work. That is great advice. Thank you for all of this. It was such a pleasure to chat with you today, Lexi. Um, Yeah. Just thanks for taking the time for it. So before you go, we would love to hear either a favorite quote or words of inspiration that you have to share with food bloggers. Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually my husband's favorite quote and I have stolen it from him because it's become one of my favorites over the years too. Um, It's by Jacob Reese. Uh, It's from the late 19th century. So it's a little 
old timey, but I think it's still relevant. <laughs> so the quote is, when nothing seems to help, I go and look at a stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two. And I know it was not the blow that did it, but all that had gone before. So I think, yeah, I think it really just speaks to perseverance. And that supports exactly what you just said for your takeaway. Just keep at it, keep trying and don't give up. That's great. Well, we're going to put together a show notes page for you, Lexi. And I think we'll put in there your recommendations even for Lightroom. I tried writing as you were talking and I... Um, I wasn't able to keep up, but that's okay because we can go back and that's what's great about podcasts. You can re-listen and we'll just write all that down, like increase exposure, decrease highlights, et cetera, so that that can give other people a baseline to maybe start with as far as tweaking their own photos. And we'll have everything else that we've talked about today on that page. If you want to go see those, go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash crowded kitchen um, and I kind of told everyone where to find you on Instagram, but why don't you just reiterate where everyone can find you all across the board? Yep. So our website is just crowdedkitchen.com. Instagram, we are crowded underscore kitchen and other social media, we're all crowded kitchen, but, um, yeah, that's where you can find us. Great. Well, it was a pleasure to chat with you and thank you so much for listening today. Food bloggers. I will see you next time. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.